Hi, and welcome to Lecture 7. In this lecture, we're going to talk about Bayesian analysis of covariance. Now, you may remember from our previous lecture that the goal of an analysis of covariance, or ANCOVA, is to test for group differences, just like you would do in an ANOVA, but also simultaneously being able to control for the influence of some covariate. Okay. So just to recall what those steps are, first step is usually we do an ANOVA itself. We, 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 we prefer the simplest model, and so if we can detect some group differences with the ANOVA, then we do so and we're happy. Now, of course, we can use the JASP ANOVA module to do this. Then the next step is if we suspect that there's going to be also some influence of a covariate, this continuous variable that may also be influencing our dependent variable, then we can do what's called calculate some adjusted means and we can then find the slope or effect of, of this covariate. And to do that, we use the JASP linear regression module. And then finally, once we're satisfied with, with that procedure, we go and we do the ANCOVA itself, which again requires a completely different module, the JASP ANCOVA module. Now, the point that I want to make here is that these are all different procedures. We have three different procedures that we have to do. And if you remember from the homework last week, that's a lot of switching back and forth in JASP. Not that it's a problem, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of things to do. So what might be then the advantage of doing a Bayesian analysis of covariance? Well, besides the normal advantages that Bayesian analyses give you over frequentist analyses, we've talked about those frequently this semester, no pun intended, I will just point out that the Bayesian ANCOVA does all of this at once, and it even does more. And that's what I want to show you today. So to do that, I want to begin with a leading example. Now, this is one that I've written about quite a bit, and I'll point you to some resources in a second. My example is a simple research question, and it's perfect for the context of uh, COVID-19 when we switched our classes from being face-to-face uh, -face classes into what were called high flex or hybrid courses. And the big question that I wanted to answer was, does synchronous attendance matter in hybrid courses? Now, what does that mean? Well, in these hybrid courses, the student uh, often will have the option of attending synchronously, either face-to-face -face or online via something like Zoom, or doing the course asynchronously. So that requires them to watch the recorded videos and then work on at their own pace, kind of like an online course. The key difference is whether you're there, either online or face-to-face, -face, or you're not and you're doing it on your own time. So the question is, does synchronous attendance matter? Now, I wanted to see uh, if it really did matter, and so I did quite an experiment with one of my courses last semester. Uh, you can see some details in my JASP blog post. I'll point you to that in just a second. But basically, I had 33 students in my fall 2020 statistics course, and I recorded several things for these students. Now, these student, these uh, these these uh, data are available. They're an, an, they're anonymous, so don't worry about anything like that. But I did record three variables for each student: their final course grade out of 100. I recorded their mode of attendance, so I classified each student as either an asynchronous attender or a synchronous attender. Again, you can see the blog post in a second for details on how I define that. And then finally, I recorded an average standardized viewing time for recorded lectures. And these were recorded in minutes, and the max was 75. It was an hour and 15 minute course. Okay. So these data are actually available for download at, the, at this address. It's osf.io slash lowercase yf. 2SB. But I'll show you how to get there. It's really quite easy, and I'll put a link to this in the description below. So I'm going to go to the JASP website, and if you just navigate to blog, okay, the JASP team puts up lots of things here, but it's uh, it's fairly recent. I did this back in November, and it's now March of 2021, so uh, it actually still appears fairly close to the top. It's this post right here. It's called How to Do Bayesian Linear Regression in JASP, a case study on teaching statistics. Well, I'm not doing linear regression today. I'm doing analysis of covariance. But as you'll see, when we get to linear regression in a few weeks, uh, they are very similar, uh, some, minor de some minor detail differences, but they're roughly the same. I'm going to click on this, though, and this will take you to my blog post. Okay, so you can, uh, there I am. You can read all about it. Uh, it's, it's a lot. It explains exactly how to answer this question in JASP. But what I want to do is get the data. So I click here to access these materials. So I'll click there. 
and it'll take me to OSF, Open Science Framework, and you'll see there is a little file over here called, let me make that go away, there's a little file over here called statgrades.csv. If I click on that, it'll give me an option to download. Okay, and there it is, and I can just say download. I've already downloaded it, so I'm not going to click it here, but there it is. And it's just three columns, and it'll have 33 rows. These are my 33 students. So I'm going to open up this file in JASP. Okay. There we go. I'm going to open up this file in JASP. There we go. And... It was something I did recently, so there it is. There's our data. Okay, so you can see the first column. This has our grades. Again, let's just check. There are 33 rows. So again, these are the uh, 33 students in the course. Uh, there's their grade out of 100. Here's their average viewing time for the recorded lectures. Uh, so I take all of the lectures over the semester and I just take the mean. Uh, the max is 75. So you can see I have some people who were either there or watched the entire lecture all the time. And then along with that, I recorded them as synchronous or asynchronous. So uh, asynchronous was zero and synchronous was one. Uh, real quickly, let me just mention, these two are not that highly correlated. There were some people who were totally asynchronous, but they watched the videos a lot. So uh, don't, don't just think that these are totally related to each other. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna perform an analysis of covariance, but we're gonna do the Bayesian version. Uh, this is actually a pretty simple one to do. We're going to go up here to ANOVA and click on Bayesian ANCOVA. Okay. Now the dialog box will be something that you're familiar with from regular ANCOVA. We need a dependent variable. Well, that's going to be my grade. That's the final grade in the course. Fixed factors, these are going to be your independent variables, the things that might have been manipulated or at least uh, quasi-manipulated in this case. So that's going to be synchronous versus asynchronous. So uh, that variable is called sync. And you can see there's already some Bayesian stuff happening over here. And then finally, I want to put in my covariates, and that's my average viewing time variable. So I'm going to get that, and let's take a look at uh, what it's giving us. It's giving us a table. You've seen this model comparison table before. We're actually going to uh, look at this table in closer detail over on my lecture notes in just a second. Uh, but you can see it's already uh, spit some things out for me. Now, I do want to mention uh, every time you do one of these Bayesian model fits, it does some, it does some estimation under the hood. It does uh, some simulation, and I'm going to get slightly different answers than what I get right here. So, for example, I can already tell you uh, I prepared this lecture before doing the video. The table that I got is slightly different from this, uh, but it's not, it's not remarkably different. The main output is still the same. So just, just be aware when you see the, quote, screenshots in a second. This is a screenshot from when I did it earlier this morning. There's a couple of other outputs that I do want to select, though. So this is the model comparison table. I also want to select the effects table. And you might remember that's when I do inclusion base factors. And then there's a new one that I'm going to do today, and that's the estimates table. Okay, And that takes a while. And then here we go. So I want to walk through these three tables, uh, talk about what they mean in some detail, and then we'll talk about how to translate this into a write-up in which we actually answer the question, does synchronous attendance matter? Okay, so let's go back to our notes. And again, I have copied earlier versions of these tables over to uh, my notes, and so that's what we'll see. All right, so here's the output. Let's, let's look at the first output first. This is the model comparison table. So you probably remember from Unit 5 when we did factorial design that we have a table like this that gives us prior and posterior model probabilities, right? And so uh, we have prior probabilities here of looks like four different models, and then we have posterior probabilities. Those are the probabilities of the models after seeing the data. And it sorts them in order from best fitting model, that is the highest posterior probability, to the worst fitting model, that is the lowest posterior probability. Now there's a few things that I want to say about this table. In Unit 5, we only paid attention to these because our goal was to, in, to compute these inclusion Bayes factors, to do Bayesian model averaging. We never did actually talk about what these two columns mean. Now is the time to do that. So let's make some notes real quick. Okay. By the way, I do want to mention, first of all, I can quickly interpret a main output from this uh, table before I even go into my notes, and that is this. 
you'll notice that the model that contains only average viewing time is the most probable after observing the data. That is, the best fitting model does not include sync. It does not include synchronous versus asynchronous. So that's, that's interesting. Does synchronicity, does synchronous attending matter? Uh, at least from what we're seeing here, it doesn't. It doesn't, the only thing that really matters is the average viewing time. So let's dig into this a little bit. Let's see what all this means. So a few things I wanna say. First of all, just like uh, in unit five, these models, these four models that we see here, are all set to be equally likely a priori. That means before seeing the data. So I don't have any strong preference for one model over the other. JASP does this by default. It sets these to be all equal. Since there are four models, you take the total model space, you know, 100%, you divide it by four, that's where the 25% or 0.25 is coming from for each of these. Okay. Now, let's, let's now shift that to posterior model probabilities. And when we do that, we get something called a BFM. This is a model Bayes factor. And what it means is it's the change in the model odds after observing the data. Okay, this is gonna seem really similar to inclusion Bayes factors, but it's, it's even easier. Okay, let me explain how this, how this works, okay? So let's, let's, let's focus on the average view model, okay? So, for the average view model, the prior odds would be the probability of that model divided by the probability of everything else, okay? So the probability of that model prior to seeing the data is 0.25. The probability of everything else, well, that's these other 0.25s. There's three of them. So if I take 0.25 divided by this sum, 0.75, I get a third, or 0.333, okay? So that's the prior odds. It's essentially one to three odds. What are the posterior odds? Well, let's look at the table. The table, the posterior odds would be the probability of that model, posterior probability of that model, divided by the posterior probability of the other models. So it's gonna be 0.663 divided by the sum of these guys. Okay, so that's what I've got written here. And when I do that arithmetic, I get posterior odds of 1.967. And so the model Bayes factor, BFM, is the quotient of these posterior odds divided by the prior odds. It's the factor by which the prior odds are updated. Okay, so it's gonna be 1.967 divided by 0.333, which equals about 5.89, which is fairly close. In fact, it's identical to what I have up here. So that's what BFM is. BFM is the update on model odds. You'll notice there's two of them here that have uh, BFMs bigger than one. That means there's only two models that received some support from the data. In other words, their model odds were increased. The rest of them, the model odds were decreased. Okay, so that's what model odds represents. The third column, the BF10, this is your other interpretation of the Bayes factor. Remember, Bayes factors can be thought of as update for model odds. They can also be thought of as the relative predictive adequacy. And specifically, this is the relative predictive uh, adequacy against the best model, okay? So what do we mean by that? Well, what we mean by that is this. Let's go back up to the table. So you'll notice that the best fitting model is average view. It has a BF10 of one. It is the best model. So its relative predictive adequacy against itself is one, one to one. But let's look at the next best fitting model. The next best fitting model takes average view and also adds in an effect of synchronous versus asynchronous. So how well does that model fit the data compared to this winner? Well, it fits it 0.464 times as much. Okay, let's, let's, let's write down what that means. That means including sync, that variable in the model, that gives this base factor, it means the data are only 0.464 times as likely if we include the effect of attendance mode, that asynchronous versus synchronous. So you'll notice it's less than one. That means the data are not as likely, okay? So it's probably even better to write it this way. Instead of reporting the base factor as a fraction like that, re reciprocate it. Take one over 0.464 and you can say the data are 2.16 times more likely if we exclude the effect of attendance mode. So these two statements, what I want you to do is pause the video and I want you to think about how these two statements are actually, a, actually saying the exact same thing. I can say the data are less likely if I include an effect 
or I can flip it, take the reciprocal, and say that they're this many times more likely if we don't include, that is exclude, the effect. Okay, so, so that's what these tables give you. It gives you two different kinds of base factors. The model odds base factors, so you want to see, you know, you want to you want to see models which lend support to the data, and then you also want uh, to look at these relative predictive adequacy base factors. Okay, so we're going to see how to write all that up here at the end. Okay, the second table, let's get all this in view. This is not new for you, so go back to lecture five. This is all inclusion base factors. So back in unit five, we did Bayesian model averaging and we computed base factors for each effect. Now I'm not gonna go to the details here. You can go back to lecture five and look at that. But remember, basically the idea is you take your effects. In this case, we've only got two possible predictors, synchronous or asynchronous, as well as the average viewing time. Uh, we don't consider interactions because these are not both um, these are not both manipulated variables, right? So um, what we do then is we take the prior odds and then we compute the posterior odds and then we divide posterior odds by prior odds and we compute the inclusion base factors. Uh, what's important to note here is this is saying much the same thing as the previous table did. It's saying that we have a very large inclusion, inclusion base factor for including average viewing time. So average viewing time matters. Uh, the data are 32.106 times more likely under models which include average view. But for sync, the model are the, the data are about half as likely under models that include this attendance mode, synchronous or asynchronous. Okay, so it's it's kind of a different way of saying the same thing we saw above. Okay. But because it does use model averaging, it does factor in the fact that instead of up here where we You'll notice when we did all this work, we picked a specific model. What Bayesian model averaging does is it says, okay, let's take all the models which have average view in them and see how much more likely the data is under them. And then same thing, let's take all the models which have the synchronous or asynchronous variable in there and see how much more or less likely the data is under those. So, so this, uh, this second table isn't just a repeat. It does a slightly different thing. And then the third table, this is the new one for us. This is the estimates table. So we're going full Bayesian here and not only doing the model testing, the, the first two tables do that for us, but it's also giving us estimates of what the actual effects are. And I'll mention these are model average. So again, they account for the uncertainty about which is actually the best model. And then across those, it does the estimates. So we may be interested in if uh, average viewing time matters, what is that effect? You know, what is the effect of average viewing time? Well, we can answer that here. So let's consider the estimate for average view. The mean, as we can see, is 0.393. And what that means is, if you think about the units, it's 0.393 points per additional minute, right? Because, well, it's a slope. Slope is the change in Y, which is the grade, points. Uh, divided by the change in X, which is the uh, minutes of viewing. So this is points per minute. And not only that, it gives us a, an estimate of 0.393 points per minute, but it also gives us, um, it gives us some uncertainty as well. It gives us a 95% credible interval. Now that's different from a confidence interval. Confidence interval is a frequentist thing. Credible interval is just, here's the distribution of, here's the posterior distribution of the effect, and so there is a 95% probability that the effect is between 0.1 points per additional minute uh, all the way up to 0.68 points per additional minute. And so we can interpret this as each additional minute of reported lecture viewing time increase the predicted grade by 0.393 points with a 95% credible interval of this. Okay. Now, one of the things you can do with this, is you can report it that way. Uh, if you look in the blog post, you'll note that I convert this into something like how many minutes you need to actually get an, a, a, another letter grade, like 10 point grade. So think about that a little bit, and then once you're satisfied with your approach to that question, go read the blog and see, see what I found in there. Okay, so let's put it all together. Uh, this is kind of a summary. What do we do with all of this information? Well, there's a lot of stuff that we should do. First is we should describe the procedure. So I might say something like this. You can use this as a template for doing your own work in this regard. So we might say something like, we performed a Bayesian analysis of covariance on the final course grades, including attendance mode, synchronous or asynchronous, as a fixed factor, 
and average viewing time as a of recorded lectures as a covariate. So just tell the reader what it is that you're doing. Now, the first thing in Bayesian and COVA is that we need to define what those models are. Remember, Bayesian stuff does model comparison. So this paragraph does that. The Bayesian and COVA works by comparing four models with varying predictors of final course grade. One, a null model. Uh, I'm not writing this here, but a null model means that you're not including any predictors. You're just you're you're predicting all of the data from the grand mean alone. Okay. So there's that model. There's two, a model containing only attendance mode as a predictor. So that's the sync model. Uh, the third model is a model containing only viewing time as a predictor. So that's the average view model. And then finally, a model containing both attendance mode and viewing time. And that's the additive model or the uh, sync plus average view model that we saw. Okay, so there's the four models. Let's describe what they are. And the nice thing about that is we can now refer to them by number. So I might say something like this. Only models three and four had their model odds increased after observing data. So these are those BFMs that we saw. And so I just list those, uh, uh, model base factor of 5.89 and 1.13, sorry, 1.331 respectively. Of these two models, model three was most probable, and then I report that posterior probability. So that's the one that was at the top of the list. And then I, uh, use the fourth column, the BF10, to say the observed data was 2.16 times more likely under model three, the winner, than the next best fitting model, model four. So all of that table stuff that we work through can be nice and succinctly written in this paragraph. Okay, so once we've done that, let's now do the Bayesian model averaging, because up here we had to commit ourselves to a specific model, model three. Now let's just consider all models, which include average viewing time as well as sync. So to account for model uncertainty, we performed Bayesian model averaging to test the effects of both predictors. And we can say the data were 32.16106 times more likely under models containing viewing time as a predictor. Uh, so that's the inclusion base factor for average view, but only 0.487 times is likely when including attendance mode. So that's the sync uh, inclusion base factor. Notice when the base factor is uh, properly less than one, I don't say more likely, I say as likely because it's less likely, right? Now we are satisfied that average viewing time matters, right? The, the data are 30 something times more likely if I include average viewing time. So now I want to estimate it. What is the effect? So that's where we go to the estimates table and we can write that this way. Thus, we believe that only average viewing time impacts course grade. So that's my, here's my model selection, and now here's the estimate. The mean effect was 0.393 points per additional minute with this 95% credible interval. And critically, attendance mode has no effect. Okay. I did put that last one in there. I'll uh, highlight this real quickly. Because remember, the way I originally phrased the question was, does attendance mode matter? And so if I stopped there and just left all that covered up, uh, that I probably wouldn't directly answer the question. So always go back and answer your question. And that's it. That's a that's Bayesian analysis of covariance. Now, as usual, there's a lot more stuff that JASP will do, but I think these are the uh, uh, things that are kind of common threads across many of the Bayes modules in JASP. And so I think this, again, gives you a good indication of how this whole game works. So remember, one of the things that I said at the very beginning was the advantage of doing Bayesian and ANCOVA over what we did last week is that uh, instead of doing three different things, Bayes does them all at once. We didn't have to switch out. Uh, and we just did one analysis and then we turned it into quite a bit of write-up. So I hope you'll use this. I hope you uh, will ask questions and uh, we'll see you on the next video. Take care.